Hello there. Welcome. Fireside with Peter Adkisson on Gen Con TV, streaming from Chaldea Studios. I am Peter Adkisson. I'm your host. My co-host is Emma Larkins, and our guest today is Monty Cook. On this show, we go in search of the untold stories behind your favorite games, and we are covering Dungeons & Dragons. Our guest today, Monty, I know he's got great stories. He talks a lot. I don't know how many of them are untold, but we'll see if we can get. We'll see if we can. We're gonna find one. We're gonna find one. <laughs> Monty, thanks so much for being on thanks our for show. Thanks me. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great to be here. Emma, thanks for coming back. Thanks for it's having me. Always good to see you. It's always good to be here. <laughs> so we are okay. So we're gonna talk about a lot about third edition Dungeons and Dragons today. But uh, I want to make sure everybody knows who you are okay. were before that happened. Like, let's, you know, this is to some extent your life story, professional story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some of the life bits we won't get to. But, All right. uh, so I think you started, if I remember right, you started your career at uh, Iron Crown. Iron Crown. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So when was that? What did you do at Iron Crown? How did you get there? I was, so I was still in college. It was the second, my second a lot some, of our stories start this way <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i was playing a lot of a game called rule master yes at the time, rule master right? aka I, chart master i've heard right? all the jokes <laughs> yes rule master chart master <laughs> yes, yes but yes. you know i was young yeah uh it was and fun it was, it was. It and was the critical hit tables yeah the alone, critical hit, yes right the critical, and the fumble tables yeah right Ooh. yeah 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 so uh playing a lot of that a friend of mine goes to origins yeah. and yeah. Uh, meets the guys at Iron Crown, finds out that they're looking for uh, someone to be a freelance writer, comes back College to students who don't expect to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's more true than I wish it was. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, came back, basically put a gun to my head and said, you're doing this. You've, you've got you've to do this. Mm. And uh, I did and published a couple of books while I was still in college. Warmed now, why did your friend think of you? Because you were publishing, and you were doing homebrew stuff. You yeah, were doing stuff he just on your was own. one of my players, right? I mean, how'd you and do that without the internet? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, well, you know, it was the friend net, right? The friend net. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, because uh, Steve went to Origins. Otherwise, I would never have known. Mm -hmm. and, right, and right. You know, I would have gone off and I don't know what I would have done, been a teacher it's or something. Horrible to contemplate those <laughs> alternate life paths. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you so you so you started working at Iron Crown. Did you uh, move to where I don't even know where their office is? Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Yeah. So right after college, I, I kinda wormed my way into an internship. Right. And then sort of made myself indispensable as, as in, much as I could in while Charles I was there. You, you moved, in Charlottesville. You moved there, okay. Right. And so they hired me full time then and uh, worked there for a couple of years. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it, was a, it was a fun and uh, uh, educational time, yeah. not a huge money making right. time. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. 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 And so, okay. And then somehow you got from there to TSR. Tell us, tell us about that. Uh, so, uh, I left Iron Crown, went off, uh, worked freelance uh, as a writer. Pretty early on, got started getting some freelance work from TSR, and, uh, and what kind of work? Like working on modules or yeah, well, it was Dragon magazine it was, articles. It was sort of a, a <coughs> tale of woe because oh, good, good. I worked tale for of woe. <laughs> I worked for yeah. about a year writing uh, Marvel superheroes uh, products. Okay, and. Then uh, TSR got rid of the Marvel license right before the first one was about to be published. Oh. So none of them ever saw the light of day. And you know, when Jonathan was on here, I think we had a, a learning moment for young game designers about designing games that don't get published <laughs> yeah. or to get yeah. canceled. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think this was related to his Gamma World story. Uh, oh, uh, right. Uh, oh, right. Because so I after they canceled the uh, the Marvel game, then they were like, well, they felt really bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so they gave me a, a new project, which was a Gamma World uh, oh. adventure. Oh. And then they canceled Gamma World. <laughs> so you and Jonathan have a Gamma World oh, connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, he tried to do it as a as a D and D project uh, at Watsi. Oh was, right. Yeah, yeah. He tried to do it. He, he submitted anyway. Yeah. Back to back to you. What is this about? <laughs> enough about enough about Jonathan Tweet. That guy. <laughs> that guy. So you went um, to Lake Geneva. Yeah. Then? Uh, I did when they hired me uh, full time in '94. Okay. Yep. Uh, Right. Like, uh, yeah, and so that was 
uh, you know, all of a sudden I'm in a little tiny town in the middle of Wisconsin, right. which was interesting um but but you know fun because it's lake geneva wisconsin and you know you can go where you know gary it's the heartland right? of I dungeons mean, and dragons exactly right? exactly yeah. Yeah. so yeah. that was that was fantastic <clears throat> um and and you know just you know walk in the halls of tsr right as a as a, someone who started playing DD when i was 11 years old i mean that's that's right. a big deal right <laughs> yeah oh i know i know <laughs> Yeah, the hollowed grounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, then everyone lived happily ever after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. initially, when they asked me to come for the interview, I had no intention of going to work there full time. Hmm. Uh, because the rumors in the industry were that they were not good to their employees, right? right. And mm -hmm. so I didn't want to do that. But I took the interview just because I wanted to see TSR. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's but, fair. you know, then I showed up and it wasn't at all. The rumors were way over exaggerated and it was actually a super fun place to work. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I imagine some of the horror stories about TSR are more in, in the executive suite. But that a lot of, I think a lot of, People who are working uh, rank and file jobs, we TSR, were, very were really happy. We were very protected. Mm. Yeah, we, I mean, yeah. Like, they sometimes referred to us as their little hobbitses. <laughs> we, we, we would go down into our little hole and play games and whatnot, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, that was a that was a very fun. I mean, until things got really bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, ninety six, ninety seven. Um, so so what did you when you first started working there? What's the first thing you worked on after you were hired? Mm. Like what or uh, it close was, to the first thing? Like what? It was uh, a, a box set uh, called Glantry: The Kingdom of Magic. Well, I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> you must Therein not, you lies <laughs> the problem. <laughs> uh, Did it not get published? Why? Maybe what happened in '97 happened. Uh, no, Did, it got published. It got published. You yeah. just didn't do a very good job on it. Or what? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody liked it. Well, you know, um, my editor, uh, I eventually married her, uh, and we were married for 14 Ooh. years, so yeah. I got something out of it. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. No, that, yeah. Uh, no that, was, that was a lot of fun, um, and it was a good sort of introduction to working at TSR. And, uh, but I'm trying to get to Planescape. All right. You worked at Plane, on Planescape, uh, Well, right? so here's the Planescape story. Yeah, yeah, let's hear. Because uh, uh, that's, that's was, something that everybody it, who loves Dungeons and Dragons, yeah. who's of a certain age, remembers Planescape. With, so, so it was the first week that I was at TSR. And, you know, back then on Fridays, new products came in on Fridays and everybody got a copy of everything, right? Mm. right so someone right. would just kind of wheel around a cart and just put stuff on your desk. And that first Friday that I was there, Planescape showed up and I had never heard of it. I didn't know it was uh, coming. Right. And I opened up that box and was just blown away. Yes. I, you know, it was just said, okay, this, this is what I want to work and on. And for anybody, mm -hmm. I guess for somebody out there who doesn't know what Planescape is, yeah. this is, uh, was in Sigil, right? Or Sigil? Right. S sigil. Uh, sigil. Uh, well, the designer says uh, Sigil. Okay, Sigil. so this was in Sigil, <laughs> which was a city out in the, on the Cogwardian Opposition Plain or something like that. Right, yes. And a gateway to many worlds. And so if you wanted to get into all the extra planar stuff in Dungeons and Dragons, man, that was the play, and it, you know introduced us to the Modrons, I think. Yep, here that's there, right. And a yep. bunch of other all the uh, yeah Modrons and and weird the, weird the elemental creatures of their type the of factions thing. that all represented sort of different yeah. philosophies and yeah, yeah it, I, was, it was it was, uh, it was cool stuff. It was about as uh, story driven and uh, you know sort of intellectual as D D had ever been at that point, right? Yeah, I mean yeah, it, it really yeah. got people to create characters that thought about you know the yeah, nature of reality yeah, and death yeah, and life yeah, it's, and yeah. It's, it's it's cool stuff. So um okay, so let's kind of talk about the era before, you know, the dark times, T S R. Like what um what was it like working in that that last year before the acquisition it was scary, right? I mean, yeah. uh, we didn't know what would happen. Um, and, and to catch everybody up who may, especially uh, may have missed last, 
last uh, week's episode because we talked about this a lot with Ryan, but not everybody watches every show. So, you know, uh, but we had, there was, TSR went through a period of financial difficulty. Right. Really severe financial difficulty. Couldn't that, afford to send things to the printer anymore. About a, uh, what was it, about a year went by with no products coming out. Hmm. Yeah. Um, um, ended in a cash flow, cash flow lockdown. Uh, Lorraine, to her credit, the owner found a way to keep all the employees hired throughout the time of having no revenue. Till the is, very end. Yeah, yeah which yeah. is pretty, uh, pretty yeah, crazy. Never, we never missed a paycheck. Yeah, like, so I mean, that's... that's that, that you says know, something. Whatever right? else we could say, right. let's say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I right. mean, good, right. on, good on her for that. And um, so it was, uh, yeah, so, you know, people can watch our other show and find out more about what that was. But um, uh, it had to have been tough. Well, I mean, you know. Like, what, what were people thinking would happen or was... Well, you know, there were there were two sort of scenarios that everybody talked about. One was that things just shut down and we all just don't have jobs, right. uh, or that somebody buys us. Right. And uh, uh, so here's the irony, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest fear was that Hasbro would buy us. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wow. Be because well, thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because at the time their sort of m uh, mode of operation would probably have been to just take the properties and get rid of the people. Yeah. That's what that's what the rumors said. Right, right, hmm. right. Uh, we right. don't know, but yeah. um, but anyway, that was that was the fear because uh, we wanted to keep our jobs. Right, right? sure, mm. of course, and, and keep keep working in the hollow ground. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. that didn't last, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ground changed. Yeah, the but... ground changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so uh, when when we heard, uh, at first through the grapevine, mm -hmm. rather than official channels, right, that right. Wizards of the Coast was uh, thinking about buying uh, TSR, that was great news. I think I mm. think pretty much across the board, everybody. I mean, I'm talking about people in my department. Right. I don't, I can't yeah. speak for anybody else. Yeah. Sure, sure. But I think we, mostly we said that's. Wow, that's going to be great. That's we didn't good. know exactly how it would work. But. Right, right. Well, this is a very interesting contrast because last week we had talked about how some people at TSR saw Wizards as kind of the, the enemy, as the upstart, who, or the usurper in I some think ways. that was more sort of on the executive side. Hmm. Right, right. Um, yeah, I think Ryan was talking about the former owner and yeah. um, uh, you know, maybe somebody else there. But... Um, um, and it's natural when you're the market leader, you know, to have a... I, I remember the first time that I went to Japan and our Japanese uh, partner told us that Magic the Gathering was no longer the number one selling card game in Japan Ooh. Mm. and uh, described this game called Pokemon. <laughs> 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 and so we went through a period of feeling better, very hostile about Pokemon <laughs> and, and, until Ishihara-san came and visited our office and invited us to be the distributor for Pokemon in America. And then we were like, we love <laughs> Pokemon. <laughs> <Pokemon's> great. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as someone who worked at Wizards at the yeah, time, right. Pokemon's great. Yes, Pokemon was, <laughs> Pokemon was fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, so let's so the deal gets done. You know, right. to, to cut cut to the chase. Right. The deal gets done. Uh, you're invited to come out uh, to Seattle and, right. uh, and relocate, and mm -hmm. you accepted the offer. You know, and, and, and a lot of people did, right? Yes. You got a lot of the TSR staff to come out. Um, yeah, I don't remember the exact number. They used to know, but there was something like. 70 some employees and I think we gave offers to 90% of the employees and I think about 90% of them said yes. Mm -hmm. So how yeah. weird of a situation is that right where you know you've got this sort of insular group of people who work together and we're all friends we're all playing games together yeah. and then a whole cloth all of us are picked <laughs> up and put on the other you know other side of the country uh, it was interesting. It uh, was. <laughs> It was interesting, especially yeah. going from Midwest to the West Coast, different right. cultures, right. Um, a long trip. Um, the, oh my God, I get emotional sometimes. The, <laughs> uh, I'll never forget, it was Kim Mohan um, at a moment with him. And Lorraine always felt that Ken's, Kim Mohan's support of the acquisition and relocation were really critical. She, she looked up to Kim and saw him as kind of the, a statesman of the of, of the under underclass. That's not, that's not inappropriate. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, and and um, uh, uh, and 
and, uh, and we gave him an offer and he said he'd think about it and he came and he said, well, I think I'm young enough to have one more adventure left in me. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he, yeah, so he came out and, and Pam and they still they live in the area. And mm-hmm. stuff. So yeah, so a lot, of pe- a lot of the TSR crew came out to Seattle. Um, it was a bit of culture shock, but I don't, th- I, I'd like to think maybe it's because I live in the, the, the you know, in, in a sort of happy place of thinking everything's great all the time, <laughs> <laughs> if for no other reason to try to make it so. Like, you know, I, I think that it went pretty well compared to how these types of deals can go. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, in a way, uh, it's like a, a marriage where uh, people come together and they've already got, they both already have kids, right? right. Yeah. And you just think, okay, the kids are all going to get together and they'll, they'll play and they'll have fun and whatnot. And that, you know, there's some rough parts at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And, yeah. And, and I understand both sides of that, right? I mean, there's sort of resentment. Who are all these new guys, right? right. And then there's, on, you know, on TSR's part, there's, you know, we used to be... Independent. And, used to be the big company. R- exactly, right? Yeah. And now we're <clears throat> part of something else, yeah. right? Well, we uh, heard about it from Jonathan's side, right? Yeah. Being joining into groups where there was like three or four other people from TSR, and then him as an outsider coming in, yeah. and how, like you said, both sides kind of had that stare down, a little bit of stare there down. There was a little bit of that, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. you know, who are these guys, right? But I remember having a conversation with Beverly, and um, I think we might try and bring her back for to talk about D and D, although she wasn't as closely tied to it. But right. she ran the editing department, mm. and so I remember having a conversation with her about the awkwardness of her as a fairly young woman at the time, um, somewhere in her 30s, um, ha- having. Um, uh, are we getting a, a cue? Are we? <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. Don't worry. Everything okay? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> getting, uh, you know, saying well as the head of the editing department, suddenly having um, people report to who have been editing 10, 20 right. lo- years longer than she has. Yeah. And how is, you know, her struggling with sort of the, just blindly accepting them, or do I try and boss them around? Do I give them an editing test? You know, I mean, like I would a new hire. Right. Uh, yeah, there was a, a lot of those types of things. Um, but I, I, I remember our HR department, you know, I remember Lin- Linda um, was, um, uh, really uh re- really excited about everybody coming in and stuff like that and mm. it was fun to redesign the office and all that stuff yeah yeah it was uh that was a culture shock too right because because we were the entire creative department and we had tsr was in this old q-tip factory right right, right. uh <laughs> yes <laughs> so it was in this enormous building really yeah. larger than we needed actually right. and mm. so th- we all had huge cubicles and there were weird places where you could play games and I mean there was a lot of space and then nice. all of a sudden right. we came you know even though the Wizards of the Coast buildings were big right we suddenly and we already had 100 people 150 people there right right yeah so it was uh, so that was a yeah. change too yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay so when you came um, organizationally what do you remember about how this, how, who did you work for when you came? Did you still work? So, and, and who I, did they work for? Like, what was the chain, what was the <laughs> chain of communication between us? Um, so once we were at Wizards, you yeah, mean? Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously Bill Slavisek's the head of our department. Right. And uh, in between uh, him and I would have been uh, a creative director. I think at the time that was uh, Ed Stark. Yes. Okay. Mm. Yep. And uh, and so when it came time to right. start talking about third edition, right. uh, I, I think those were the two guys who were kind of thinking, okay, who's who's going to be right for this team? Yeah. So mm. now the process, I was, um, I remember the process for deciding who was going to be on the third edition team. I left that to I think Bill sure. and, and to figure out, hey, however you guys make these decisions, <laughs> you know, because I was in a position of like what decision, you know, you want to make sure you give some decisions, empower the new uh, staff that are here, and at the same time, you know, make sure they do it the way you want them to. Right? <laughs> yeah. So you can pick what decisions you're going to meddle in to what extent. Right. And I, I think I left it to Bill. So you pick who's going to be on the. Third, and, and so you guys, and to his what, credit, yeah. I think he did something really smart. So t- yeah, tell uh, because us, everybody what, what you... probably expected him to just sort of pick the guys who'd been there the longest, mm-hmm. or you know, you know, fa- right. play favorites or whatever. Right. Mm. But right. what he did was he had us all uh, write 
basically an essay hmm. that was if you could if you get to do a new edition of Dungeons and Dragons, what would you do? Right. And they chose the designers from the results of that. From a, wow. You know, what they well, like to essay question. And that yeah. was, <laughs> it was a test. You and Skip Williams That's and right. Rich Baker. And Rich Baker. Yep. Yep. Hmm. So do you remember what you wrote? <laughs> like what you said you would do with third edition and how much of it came true? Um, you know, I was a big fan of bringing a lot of the uh, first edition stuff back, like oh, the okay. half work and like the assassin, weapon speeds, and uh, no. segments of a melee round, no. and the, 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 the variations <laughs> on the to hit chart based on which weapon versus which armor type, which is That's not the right. same thing as armor no, class. It's not the same <laughs> thing, right? Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, but Just working on my geek cred there. A bit. <laughs> no, I, no one's questioning your geek cred. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta maintain these things, Monty. You yeah. gotta maintain these things. <laughs> I could, I could quiz you. I could give you some trivia questions. Uh, okay. But okay, we'll do Are a new show. <laughs> right? Ask Derek. He's up for a for a trivia question <laughs> challenge. All right. All right. No. Uh, I I don't. I, I remember that. And you wanted to bring back because oh, you were talking about like half orcs and yeah. assassins and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I yes. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. would have hired you on the spot for that if I had been in the loop <laughs> based on that. But yeah, you know, we were simpatico on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew. Uh, oh, I, actually, I didn't know that at the time, but I learned pretty soon after that 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 was also a, a big right, thing for right. you. Right. Well, and you also won my heart with Paladin in Hell, right? Oh, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Paladin in Hell. Uh, that um, was an event, a supplement that we came out with shortly after the acquisition. I don't know if it was. Right. An, it, it had to have been. It couldn't have been authorized. It wasn't authorized by previous management, no. right? This was something. No, this and this was you yeah, because yeah. you <laughs> said. We got to bring demons back into Dungeons yes, and right. Dragons. Demons and devils back into Dungeons and Dragons, baby. <laughs> just like, yes. This was the order from on high yes. as soon as we arrived, right? Yes. And yes. so. Demons. Demons, demons. devils. Demons. And, yes, exactly. And, right? and third edition, right? And so, you know, Priorities. my. Uh, again, that was sort of a. Uh, I, as soon as I heard that, I put in a pitch. I said, we got to base this around this piece of art. From yes. the original yeah. player's yeah. handbook, right, right, because one of the best pieces of D and D art ever made, and it, you know, one of the few that actually has a, a cool caption, right, yeah. uh, a, a paladin in hell, right, and there's a yes. big full page, and so uh, I said, that's, <laughs> that's that's how we, we get do demons this. and devils back, right, yeah, yeah. So. It was such a show off. I mean, that was, that was a brilliant <laughs> idea. And there you were showing it off. That was great. Yeah. 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 Sidebar. Emma, yeah. Uh, we did have a question about Kickstarter in the chat. I, I want to leave that till the end. But okay. I just wanted to let chat know that we saw your question. Uh, we'll come back to that. Yep. Yeah. We are going to talk about your Kickstarter at the end. Okay. So you worked on that. And then, okay. So let's get into third edition. All right. Let's start. Mm -hmm. So you, you start with Skip and Rich. Skip and Rich. Yep. And who were like, these were the guys who sort of had the reputation in the in the department of being like like skip was the sage right I mean, yes. if you wrote a question into D&D &D, yeah that skip wasn't just it, yeah yeah right? yeah skip was the sage and specifically what that means in, in dragon magazine back right. in the day you could write rules questions into TSR and the sage would answer all the rules yeah yeah skip yeah so of course. i was expecting rich and skip like I, I went into it thinking okay these are the guys who are going to they're going to want to you know uh, kind of maintain the status quo a little bit. Right. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to be the guy who like shakes things up and tosses out the crazy ideas right. and they will moderate me. Right. 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 <laughs> and so the first day I come in and I say, let's bring back assassins. Let's do half orcs. Let's, you know, have armor class go up or whatever, you know, right. just all these crazy <laughs> ideas. And they were like, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, well, I was going to say the same thing. Right. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, I don't have a safety net. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's, gosh. Who's, you know, uh, and you know, and, and and they had just as many kind of wild, crazy ideas as I did, hmm. and right. and so it, I had to kind of readjust my thinking a little bit, but but it, yeah, it was it was a good time, it was a good team, and you yeah. were the the head of the team at first, right? That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I I had a, a kind of a delicate conversation, a series of delicate conversations with John, um, Bill Slavisek, Ed Stark. And Ryan Dancy, where I said, I, I know you're in the management chain here, but not when it comes to third edition. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for the rules. Not for the rules. And so, yeah, so I had the, the in, in that function, the uh, three of you reported to me, and we met once a week in that but, little But just think thing. about that for a minute, right? Yeah. Uh, we became friends, and, yeah. and that was all. But 
I'm hired, brand new, I'm at a brand new company, brand new hierarchy, right? right. And all of a sudden, essentially, my boss's boss's boss <sighs> is is now the lead of my team, right? <laughs> And, and what's, company. Yeah. 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 Right. And, what, I mean, and what's he designed? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so that was a little intimidating, I got to yeah. tell you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but, no, but my God, it's so much fun. Yeah. I put yourself in my position. I mean, like you, you hire, you, you buy TSR, you get Dungeons and Dragons, you've, you've been doing house rules for D&D for 20 Living years. The dream. Like, Okay, I, 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 I don't, I'm not qualified to be a designer on this team, but I can manage the team. They can all report to me, and, and, that'll be, and then I'll have to be invited to meetings. And I'll get to weigh in and debate. Come on, what, what d d player growing up in the 70s and 80s didn't think, maybe one day I'll go and I'll run D&D, &D, right? Yeah, I yeah, mean, was, and you did it. That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so... Um, um, Let's, uh, so eventually Jonathan is added to the team. Mm. Right. Um, there, uh, of course, it's always, can be a little bit dramatic. A anything you want to say about, any commentary you want to share about Jonathan coming onto the team? Oh, man, what a jerk. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. Good. Actually, Good. sadly, Good. Uh, I only have the nicest things to say about it. Uh, mm. Jonathan was a great addition to the team, and, uh, you know, looking back, um, I think I feel like I learned a lot from Jonathan, and um, you know, mm -hmm. thank God he was on the team. Yeah. Is, is mm. what I have to say about Jonathan. Good. Great, great, that's fantastic. Good choice. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was interesting, right? And and I understand why it would be you know trepidation because you, you know, you you had Bill choose right. designers, right? right? And then sort of you came in and said, plus Jonathan. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So I can see why that would be. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I don't know, and I, I always worry that, I, I've said this before, and I always worry that some of the TSR people, I, I hope they're not too offended, but I felt that it really was a strength of Wizards was uh, design skill because of Magic the Gathering. The, you know, the design requirements mm. right. uh, for a game like Magic were, were so much stricter and higher because we were doing, especially once we started doing competitive tournament scenes and all the, how, the, how tight the rules had to be. And... In spite of the menagerie that is the Magic the Gathering rules, uh, you know, we, we developed uh, some skill there. And I was like, you know, I really got to get some of that skill on the team. And mm. Jonathan was making a mess of other things. So, you know, <laughs> we just, just threw it. Really, I mean, you know, the 30,000 foot view and, and obviously hindsight, right? That was absolutely the right thing to do, right? You've got TSR people who are, you know, we, we knew mechanics and whatnot, but, but we were also really strong on story yeah. and flavor yeah. and that kind right. of thing, right? Yeah. So you bring in Watsi's strength, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And marry yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's get into some of the mechanics. I mean, I think, I th I'm sure we gotta have, people, love, gamers love to talk about mechanics. Yeah. So third edition, um, Pick a topic that, you, that would be fun to, like, like you well, have know, some connection to in terms of, of initiative or armor class or whatever. Um, I don't care. Well, you know, no, uh, so, so the idea of reversing the way armor class went actually didn't start with us. Um, it was you. It was first utilized. I think St Steve Winter. I hope I'm not wrong in that, but I think I, Steve Winter came up with it. I think you're right. And, and, and uh, lots of people it, had house rules around it. Right. I, I did that. Right. In my and own. it was actually in one of the editions of Gamma World, where. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think it was Steve Winter in Gamma World. I think it was. Yeah. Um, so. That, to us, that was a no-brainer. Right? Yeah. We all, yeah. from the you, first day. You want to day. describe what that means. Yeah, so uh, in previous editions of Dungeons & Dragons, if anybody ever... Uh, yeah, okay, i got to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> in previous editions of Dungeons & Dragons, your armor class started at 10 and went down. Right. And if it got really good, it would be a negative number. So right. if you have plate mail and shield, it would be armor class 2. Whereas in third edition and sense would be armor class eighteen, right? Right. right. Yeah. And so, so you was, wanted to roll high to get the lower number of classes, <laughs> and you had to look up a chart. There yes. was a chart, mm. and it varied by character class. So was it just like like if you're a fighter, you use this chart. If you're a right. cleric, you use this chart. If you're a monster, you use this chart, and you compare your level or hit die versus the armor class of the opponent and it would tell you the number or you could the second edition had a great invention Thacko. 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 i was just gonna Which say was... you're actually showing your age by <laughs> yeah. not bringing up Thacko yeah. because yeah. Thacko was the 
was the development. Well, that was the second edition of the thing. I, exactly. I tend to focus on the odd numbered editions of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> so, okay, so anyway, Me too. The, 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 the logic was let's, uh, let, let's just change the direction those numbers go. The scaling was kind of similar in that, like, if you oh, think yeah. about Plate and Shield being armor class going from 2 to 18, that's a difference of 8 from 10. And so the scale was kind of similar. Yeah, mm. pretty Your much. Your pluses to hit. And so then it became this thing, like, oh, I roll a 20 sided die, add my pluses to hit. If it equals your armor class, I hit. Hmm. Seems so natural, but that's not the way Dungeons and Dragons was played for 20 some years. Right. right? Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was a no brainer. Um, you know, one of the, th so if you remember, first and second edition didn't have skills. They had proficiencies, proficiencies yep. which were kind of this weird mishmash of you could be proficient in cooking, but you could also be proficient in, you know, tying ropes, and uh, they were just kind of all over the board. Right. So we knew we wanted to make a, a more robust set of skills. And you had skills that were collected class. Like, you, you had your thieves' skills. Which were different, for, for, for and they different. worked completely differently, yeah, yeah, right? Because yeah. they were percentage-based. Yeah. Right. Um, and so yes. we wanted to marry all of that together, right. create a system, because, you know, Still a class-based game, but the idea that, you know, well, you're not a thief, so you can't climb, and you can never climb, uh, you know, just didn't, yeah, didn't yeah. really hold a lot of water. So yeah. uh, we, we wanted to marry all that together, and what we saw as we started developing that was that there were these certain skills that we wanted to make sure we put in the game, but they didn't, they were unlike the other ones because they didn't, you didn't roll. You didn't, yeah. you did, there wasn't a, a, a check involved, right? Right, mm. right. And that's where feats came from. Like the ability to use a shield. Right. Huh. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so we, we just, uh, we created uh, feats which were originally called heroic feats. Yes. Uh, and we dropped the heroic. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Everyone's heroic. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and so that's that's where feats <coughs> came from, which is interesting because I've heard a lot of different theories about where feats come from. Mm. Right. And but that's where feats come from. That's they were just know. they kind of grew out of out of these skills. Of an overhaul of the skills section, yeah. right. a, a consolidation of all these skills from different things, including weapon proficiencies and exactly. armor proficiencies and thieves skills. And uh, that opened blah, blah, blah. up like right. that. I mean, that's a new game design currency, right? Mm -hmm. That that opened up a whole new way for us to give cool character powers and right. abilities. Um, you know, but they weren't they weren't skills and they weren't tied to your class necessarily. And so, it, and and this is kind of jumping forward on the side. Like in fifth edition, the feat stuff's been really pulled back from what it was in third. Like, um, hmm. what, what do you think that was? Do you think it was a good idea? Do you have a comment on that? I like third edition feats yeah. uh, a lot, and I know that there was a lot of proliferation as the game went on, and there were all like the D twenty yeah. stuff that came out, yeah, the feats stuff, yeah, and 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 you know, not everyone was. The problem with the feat is that it is a discrete game design element, and and so a feat has to equal a feat has to equal a feat, right? And yeah. you screw that up, and and right. you know, yeah. You got. How about uh, lucky? Being lucky was that before? Was that your time, or is that a new thing? That's that's uh, inspiration and lucky. And lucky is high to inspiration. The inspiration's new. That's fifth edition. Maybe right. it's in fourth. Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I don't. <laughs> uh, it, it's no, one inspiration that people is say new. is a little bit broken. So like, if you're lucky, you just like oh, I spent my luck point. And I get to reroll my my dice. Right. Um, no, that's that was not that's, part of third edition. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and inspiration works the same way, yeah. right? And it's that's a yeah, it's a pretty powerful mechanic. I I, I it uh, my, I don't know where uh, in my mind that idea goes clear back to Fiend Folio. There was uh, the thing. What was the thing? The, the the shadow version of yourself that would follow you around, and if you got a tween, if you got oh. a tween in Fiend Folio, uh, every time you attacked, you wow. get to roll two dice and You're take the right. higher roll. Mm. You're right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that mechanic was so interesting that it, <laughs> it, it kind of grew wings. I um, forgot about the tween. Yeah, the yeah. tween. I had a character with a triple tween. I got to roll a three dice every, every, every time I attacked and take the highest <laughs> roll. Uh, Is that gross? Broken. broken. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so do you remember uh, like um, a debate, a fisticuffs with uh, in the design team over a, a, an issue like like pulling this way, pulling that way. You know. There yeah, were about it, or an interesting evolution of hmm. uh, of something that came Initiative, from lots of debates. I think was probably the longest sort of 
knockdown, drag out kind of fight. Um, we must have gone through, I don't know, like, like no exaggeration, probably like eight different, completely different initiative systems, right? Um, and uh, it was Jonathan's idea to uh, create the initiative system that eventually ended up in there, which is uh, what we called cyclic initiative, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Where yeah. the round doesn't, once you get going, right, you don't re-roll every round. Right. And yeah. and just based on on the idea that, you know, you're not rolling new initiative every single round. Right. Um, and and that was, I remember that being kind of an eye-opening thing for me was the, the idea that, you know, if you can if you can look at something like that that happens, mm-hmm. what twenty, thirty, fifty times during a game session, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and eliminate that or or right. decrease it by hugely, right? You're going to make the game run faster. You're going right. to make things right. move yeah. more s- smoothly. And that idea, well, not only do I feel like <clears throat> that's now a big part of my own uh, game designer toolbox, but uh, you know, it, it manifested in third edition in a lot of ways, right? Where we well, and and not only the cyclical thing, saving the initiative roll, but saving the, the the even the worst part was the declaration phase that you had in A D and D, where at the beginning of the round, uh, everybody would declare what their actions were, mm-hmm. and then if you were right, <laughs> depending so on how you interpreted the rules, you'd add how many we may add weapon speeds or segments, uh, right. and figure out your order of who went, and so you're recalculating that every time. It had the beauty of like. Okay, a ninth level spell is going to take nine segments, and therefore it should take. You know, you can imagine the wizards doing all the like that, but but it's not worth it. But it's not worth it, yeah. right? Because it's, eventually, what yeah. you ended up doing in first edition was you had to you had to tell the DM what you were doing every round twice, right? Mm. right? Yeah. In the declaration yeah. phase, and then when it finally got to your phase, right. then right. again, right? Yeah. I'm casting that spell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. It's funny because yeah. it seems so normal now. As someone who's fairly recent to Dungeons and Dragons, it just seems so obvious. It's like, oh, thinking about the way it must have been, it's just like, but, but why? Like, that's insane. Who, who, <laughs> who even think about that? So it just became so natural. You know, people, I think, adopted it. I, I, fairly yeah, I naturally. imagine there's a lot of things like that, right? Yeah. That I, I've had so many conversations with people who are really big fans of AD&D and never really left it or second edition, you know, and, and, and I, I would say, oh, you like this declaration of, and, and the answer is always, oh, we don't play that way. Right. Like, okay, you like AD&D better because you don't play by the rules. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I won't mention names, but his initials are Stefan Picorni. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that was that was a big part of third edition was was kind of figuring out, and again, right? We had we had great resources for this because we had Skip Williams on the team who was right. like interacting with people, but figuring out how people were actually playing second edition, right? Because, you know, develop that's that's the key to where the game needs to go is how people actually play, right. not what the rules say, right? And so, right. like the. Uh, you know, you go to negative 10 hit points, right? right? And right. so people wanted some yeah. kind of mechanic that made it so that you didn't just die at zero, right? Mm. right. And things like that, um, you know, mm-hmm. that's how people really played, even though they right. weren't actually yeah. in the book. Hmm. Uh, actually, I just, uh, well, negative 10 was in the DMG of AD&D. Uh, there was um, a, it's uh, like an optional rule. Though. Yeah, I think it was probably an optional rule, mm. but it was like a, a thing where like if you went to a zero, you passed out and you started to bleed one every round. There was no right. there was no saving throw you could make on your own oh, to right. stabilize. It For was sure. just like no, there's no like there's a clock. <laughs> My minus five, minus six, minus seven. <laughs> Cleric, please kill me. <laughs> kill me. <laughs> but but you know by the time second edition came along, I mean everyone was using right like, right ten rule, right. and so right. that just informed the decisions <clears throat> that we made. Right. So. Thinking about third edition um, now, twenty years later. So what, what, what do you think the th- what the bits of it that? Well, let's say it this way: if we had another year of development, we might <laughs> might, might, might might have been able to do a better job with certain things. Any anything you want to? Yeah. So, um, you know, we created this version of D and D where character creation was really robust. You got to make a lot of choices, right? One choice affected other things, right? There were lots of derived stats and whatnot, Mm. which is great. That's great for players. But then we got this order from on high (laughs) 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 that NPCs and monsters had to work exactly like 
right. characters, right? Like, right. like player like, characters. Like player character races, yeah. right. Um, and, and I understand the reason for that, right? Because you, 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 you want that, that ability to like match things yeah. up. Why can't an orc be a fifth level fighter? Right. Come on, Monty, right. really, right. seriously. Well, and, <laughs> and, and, and that, that isn't even, I mean, orc being a fifth level fighter, that's, that's okay. Right. It's exactly. The, it's the you know. Well, okay. So he's got this skill bonus, which is going to you know have a synergistic effect with this, right? And and all of a sudden, uh, it's nothing that making... a good spreadsheet can't solve. <laughs> <laughs> good spreadsheet or two, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Multiple tabs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we 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 made a game that was pretty hard to yeah. be a, a a DM. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, unless you were running something, you know, straight out of a module. Or I something. suppose. Uh, we made a game where, you know, I mean, take every time you made a PC or a new monster or whatever, uh, an NPC or a, or a new monster, uh, it took as long as it took to make a player character. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. So I, I'd love to go back and change that. Right. And, and fifth yeah. edition doesn't have that. Right. And yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it is certainly a hallmark of the games that I've designed since then that. Uh, now, NP, you know, I make it so that uh, I guess as I get older, I, I feel more and more sorry for the game master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I make his job or her job uh, as as easy as mm. I can. Yeah. So we had some questions about the yeah. open gaming license. Is yes. that something that you want to discuss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about sure. the open gaming awesome. likeness. Yeah. Sure. Do you have any experience? <laughs> 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 yeah, something that seems to feed do, do you have a specific? Uh, do you have a specific question? About I'm just it? asking about the yeah. generalities about the open gaming license, how it happened, your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's, uh, from my point of view, that's the brainchild of Ryan Dancy. Yep. And uh, he basically came to uh, Jonathan and Skip and I at the time, Rich Baker, and I'm pretty sure had left the team by then. Yeah. Um, and, you know, kind of pitched us this <coughs> idea. And... Um, I think at first none of us thought it was a very good idea, but I think it's just sort of that natural instinct of let other people design yeah, Dungeons and, and Dragons. And, 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 and just so everybody knows what we're talking about, Open Gaming Lightness and, um, was this idea that um, we could let, that people outside of Wizards slash TSR, Hasbro eventually, um, could create Dungeons and Dragons material on their own independently, even commercially. Um, without having to ask us for approval and, right. and by, by setting up the um, and, and and to avoid having to use our trademark Dungeons and Dragons we created D20 as a trademark and so you could advertise stuff with D20 so that's that's what, before 1999 ish people couldn't do that right right yeah. if you you couldn't publish a oh. your a monster manual to be used with Dungeons and Dragons um, and and at least or if you did, you had to disguise it to some extent. And, mm. and, and you or seek out a license. And do or, or get a license, yeah. get permission. But yeah, Which that wasn't was going to happen. Pretty yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, pretty hard to do. Okay, so back. So yeah, yeah. so, um, but, but I'll be honest, the, the three of us came around to the idea pretty quickly. We saw hmm. the benefits. Again, yeah. thanks to Ryan, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and I think we sort of became the ambassadors to the rest of the design staff of, you know, helping right. Ryan convince. Because there was... There was a lot of people who really needed some convincing that yeah, that was going to yeah. be a, a, a good idea, but but I think demonstrably it was. Uh, well, yeah, I, think was I mean, I think there. Well, you you became a, a D twenty publisher, so you're going to. You, you I'm can, biased. You, <laughs> yes. you, but well, biased in one, but not. I mean, I think you could find D twenty publishers who who thought it was ended up being horrible for them, right? There was a there was a glut. Of product right, on there the market. was. As soon as this was announced, people started working on it, and within two or three, there was a peak of just tons and tons and tons of, of D20 product in the market, and I, I think some people did not survive that era. Mm. There, when when uh, D20 first started happening, there were a bunch of us who said, we're going to collect every D20 thing that comes out, right? We're going to have a copy. Oh my gosh. Uh, and that lasted about a month. Yeah. And we were just like, okay, we can't afford this. This is crazy. Yeah, There's way too much stuff. I went crazy getting stuff, yeah. yeah the <laughs> White Wolf did some D20 stuff, which I really enjoyed. Yeah. And, um, mm. and uh, Chris Pramus. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. So there are a couple. Yeah. So I, I agreed that it, it was a great thing. It was a, it was a bolt of lightning to the Dungeons and Dragons brand. It brought so many and companies probably to the whole game industry. Right? Yeah, 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 and yeah. it brought a, a lot of companies were now supporting Dungeons and Dragons indirectly, and it allowed for 
you know, for me, the compelling business reason uh, was especially looking at the numbers was Ryan Dancy, which was a, a numbers thing of like, hey, we have all these campaign settings that people love, but we can't publish them. We can't support them because right. with the cost structure we have as a larger organization, which became even worse under WOTC in terms of, of what the cost burdens were on individual costs, you know, um, profit and loss centers, hmm. was we, we can't do all these. We can't support all these. Right. Uh, worlds and uh, you know, <laughs> Ryan mentioned somebody wants to do a, a space ninja, you know, <laughs> adventure. Right. Right. Like we we can't do that, but now somebody else could do it. Right. Right. Well, but so there's the downside. Uh, the only the only negative thing I'm going to say is is that when this idea came along, uh, unfortunately a little late in the process because uh, basically third edition was done. We were yeah. done designing mm -hmm. when this. And if Ryan had come to us earlier on, if he'd had this brainstorm earlier right. on, we probably would have made some different design decisions, right? Because right. right. we designed, I mean, we had the marching orders, make yeah. Dungeons and Dragons the best game it could be, right. which is the right thing to do, but, but we didn't know that we were designing an right. engine that was gonna be for science right. fiction and yeah. horror, yeah. And, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You, you have a question there? Uh, yeah. no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just it's never want. I just never. Uh, I just never want you to feel like you can't work <laughs> yeah. like, like, uh, Okay. So um, one thing. Um, so I want to go back to like this. I, I have my opinions on what we could have done better with third edition. Okay. So, so this would be a good thing to, to, right. to test, right? right? So, um, if I look back and think, um, if we'd had another year, I do feel that um, I. But first of all, I think monsters having opportunities to have classes and levels is a great idea. You're, you're totally wrong about that. <laughs> uh, but, but classes the, and levels aren't the problem. It's, but it's, the, it's, it's everything. All the other stats. So maybe, maybe actually, maybe my concern is actually closer to what you were, you were getting at. Hmm. Like the interconnectivity of how your stats would affect so many things right. really did drive me to using spreadsheets. I mean, I did, you know, I mean like you, you know, putting stats electronically. So, it, you know, and we even made it worse by having things like poison do damage to your constitution and things like that. And so, well, right. of course, if your constitution goes down, then your hit points go down and your fort saves go down and oh, it's all, all interconnected. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it ripples through the system. And that, that was, I think, um, um, maybe could have been more elegant, right? Maybe It we, really maybe. hindered high-level play, too. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, which is a shame, Yeah, because everybody should be playing high-level <laughs> high level with team. three tweens. I mean, three with, with a triple tween, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. Tween. Throw it down, throw it down, baby. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that there was um, the power curve in, um, in third edition D&D, &D, you know, it, it, it was really a steep power curve like with, with the bonuses that you would get uh, yes. over levels and from uh, from various things that could stack and um, uh, you know it, it you know you 20 the, the the power difference between a 20th level character and a 10th level character or whatever was 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 huge right mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I admitting to that uh, and I was as much a culprit I mean I was pushing pushing hard for all these all the things that contribute to this problem you know um, Fifth edition does doesn't have as much of that power curve. The, the power curve in fifth edition is flatter, has a lower right. slope but a higher y-intercept, mm -hmm. right? I mean, first yes. level, fifth level characters. There's been this progression in D and D of um, every edition, well, at least all the odd editions, of <laughs> first level characters getting more and more powerful. Yes, mm -hmm. true. Yeah, fifth level, first level characters in fifth edition are. I, you know, I, I haven't dimmed a lot of fifth edition, but one thing I learned right off the bat is you, you design. They're a lot sturdier. Don't throw giant rats and rock groves and <laughs> crap like that at parties. You know, right. th th you know, first level group group can probably take on an ogre easy. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe two or three. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, uh, but then the power curve doesn't go up as fast. Like, you don't get bonuses to hit until right. your proficiency bonus goes up, which is like at fifth level or something like that. Where, right. in third edition, your fighter was getting a plus one to hit every level. Right. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, uh, uh, you know, because of the way third edition worked, right? We had to come up with a way of uh, kind of creating an expected amount of, of magic, right? So right. we, in order for that curve to work, right? So that we can say, you know, tenth level party should go up against this creature, we right. had to know what magic items because that made a huge right. difference, yeah, right? Yeah. And so that was. 
I mean, I, it worked, but it was uh, it was a it was a lot of work, yeah. and mm. you take yeah. away that power curve a little bit, yeah. and all of a sudden the expected uh, nature of of magic and whatnot. Mm. It yeah. kind of goes back to magic sort of being a little more it fluid and magic. It probably was a bit of a magic-heavy system, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> In terms of how much magic items and stuff like that people mm. would have. Yes. Yeah, it probably might have erred a little on the power gaming <laughs> side. <Yeah. laughs> well, who is your target audience for this? Were Me. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I, I say that this sounds like a total jerky sort of uh, egocentrical all. thing, but um, I, I've always kind of had this attitude with certain games that mm. um, if I make the game I want, there's somebody out there that's, that sure. wants the same yeah. thing and will like it. Like, you know, um, and with Dungeons and Dragons, I just said, listen, we're just going to make this. We, we just want to make the game that we want to yeah. play. Well, so experienced gamers, yeah. then, is kind of more what you're having in mind, where for the more modern ones raising first levels like it's more for the the new player just getting we into it absolutely there mm -hmm. is that is insightful there was um i think that wizards in fifth edition was was leaning towards targeting casual players and new players mm -hmm. and we were leaning towards ca uh be, be re-energizing um old players mm -hmm. and not worried so much i i, I mean i kind of learned that from magic the gathering there was all these times you know, where we tried to do a magic the gathering starter game simplify the rules and it's no nah, it's a hard game deal with it <laughs> you know i'm gonna take a little bit of issue with that <laughs> yeah good yeah because yeah. you know if you look back at first and second edition um yeah you know a, there's a lot more sort of number crunching in third edition but at least it's all based on a core mechanic and it's right? laid out for you and the, not hidden. The, the you're lack using of... my own my <laughs> own argument against me you're 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 absolutely right right the like... lack of a core mechanic in first and second edition is such a <clears throat> hurdle yeah. to get yeah. i mean yeah my favorite yeah. bit of criticism that we ever got from uh game players about third edition was this guy who wrote in he said well <laughs> You've made a game that anybody can play. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a criticism. Yeah. <laughs> so so that that's a fair uh, that's a fair clarification, right? Mm -hmm. Like we we definitely wanted to have make it a more elegant system, a tighter system, something that was easier, but but we were not trying to simplify it. Mm -hmm. Right. We were trying to make it more oh, elegant, yes. make it more sensible, make everything yes. work right. Elegant, um, more elegant, but, not but, simpler. But we were not trying to dumb it down, no. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So hey, we're getting close to an hour and I really want to talk about Tolis, your new oh, Kickstarter, your cool. new company, everything you're doing now. Like, sure. Like, Let's get, do that. Yeah, catch us up on the last, uh, what, 15 years? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then give us a big Speak squeal up. on Tolis and do that all in seven minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Um, so uh, I left Wizards in 2001, started a, a D20 company, mm -hmm. Melhavik Press, that went on for uh, about six or seven years. Um, now I've got a different company. Okay. Uh, it's not, we don't... Uh, produce a lot of OGL stuff. We've got our own games, uh, Monty Cook games. Yep. We do Numenera and the Cypher system and Invisible Sun. Um, uh, all well, of another great setting, by the oh, way. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. you. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, informed by the stuff that we're talking about right. today, right? Right. Uh, right. Uh, you know, hopefully maybe making things a little bit easier in the ways the third edition was harder, but, you know, taking a lot of sure. the good lessons Right. Um, I, like I said, I learned a lot working on third edition. Yeah. Um, and uh, so back when I was doing um, El Habit Press, and even before that, when I was uh, working on third edition, you know, I had my own home game, right? And, yeah, yeah. and we were playing, and so I had to create a world, and it was called Tolis, right? And it was all yeah. set in this big city. The city is located over this giant dungeon, mm. right? And it's by this giant spire with this big evil castle at the top, right? Because what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a setting where even when you create your character in your first level, what you're gonna do at 20th level is literally <laughs> hanging over your head, <laughs> right? Oh. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's, that's kind of told us in a nutshell. Um, and So it wasn't a democracy setting, it was more like a dictatorship or a ru or evil overlord setting? Um, um, it, Oligarchy. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's complicated. A despot. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, and so yeah, the, the commissar rules uh, uh, over uh, Tolis. And... Nice, the commissar. <laughs> Love it. Um, 
And so that was the game that I ran for years and years and years, right? right? And, you know, my players were, you know, all the names it, that you know from D&D yeah. &D and whatnot. 20th level, triple teens, <laughs> tweens, <laughs> tweens, triple tweens. Yes, yes. Yeah. Anyway, so at, well, when, in 2006, I published it as this giant book. Yeah, uh, massive. And uh, pulled out all the stops, you know, embossed cover, cloth right. bookmarks right um you know the binding is so solid you can whip it across the room you'll damage your wall but you won't <laughs> hurt the book you might kill a dire rat <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh it, it it was very successful in fact it sold out right away uh was too expensive to ever reprint uh so you know it was i, I think on it's going for like you know 300 and some dollars on ebay or whatever right. now right. Yeah. um so now fast forward to 2020 and i'm putting it back out and we're make, gonna make it compatible with fifth edition right. and a version that's compatible with uh the cypher system which is the game okay. that i designed and uh, we're kickstarting it right now Ooh, as we fun. speak. Oh, oh my really? <laughs> it's live on Kickstarter it right is. now. If somebody wanted to, if they could go to, to. Kickstarter.com and type in PTOLUS. Like, like I did. I did. <laughs> yeah, I did there this. There might be a link in the chat. Ooh, you can just there, click yeah, on. there might be a link. Easier. You can go there. Even better. Right. Oh. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Kickstarter, the question I mentioned, talking about foreshadowing back to the earlier in the show, someone had asked if you have any advice for first time creators on Kickstarter. Uh, just a little nugget of wisdom. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know uh, you spent a whole show on this. Yeah. Uh, so. There's a lot of things, but I'll, I'll, I'll just pick one, and that is pick a realistic date that you think this thing, whatever you're kickstarting, it doesn't matter if it's a game or anything, don't, don't give yourself a date that you're going to be late on, right? I mean, to deliver. Yeah, yeah, to deliver, right? Because that, it's just become such a cliche. Oh, it's a Kickstarter and it's late, right? If you can be the guy who doesn't, whose Kickstarter actually delivers on time, you're already way ahead of the game. Great. Oh, cool. That's Love great. <laughs> well, you know, Whatever my, your I, date is that you think, <coughs> double or triple that, exactly. and that's going to be the right. date. Add yeah. three months or <laughs> yeah. a year yeah. or whatever, right? <laughs> no one's going to be sad if it's early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so reflecting back on, uh, on your time at Wizards, what, what's sort of your fondest, what's your takeaway? What's, what do you reflect back on? And um, you know, it is it is just such a fun experience, whether it was TSR or WOTC, right? To yeah, just sure. get a bunch of Fair. really creative people together, put them in a room, and you know, and sometimes whether whether you're doing something crazy and just blowing off steam, or whether you're actually doing your job. I mean, for for two and a half years, it was my job to sit in a room with you know two or three of the most talented game designers I've ever worked with. And you know, we would sit down and we would say, okay, so today we're gonna talk about second level cleric spells. <laughs> <laughs> that was my job, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, yeah. that's I mean, uh, it yeah. just doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Right? It's just the conversations you have, right? Yeah. It's like, so if this cleric is attacking the ogre, right. you know, what is... And everybody's got gaming stories mm. and, right. you know, great ideas and, and you're playing off of each other's ideas. And yeah. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. I, I miss those days. I had Richard uh, oh, right. on, on the show uh, last summer and um richard garfield and it was um I, and he actually came over for dinner it's kind, kind of about that time i come over for dinner too and we hung out and just reminded the types of conversations i used to have with him and which okay. reminded me of the types of conversations i had at wizards and yeah i really miss those hmm. you know uh it's it's um uh don't get to hang out you know i don't hang out with designers much you know and it's, it was good Oh, good times. Well, yeah. Monty, I, I, I want to say I really, I really respect your work. I'm really oh, glad, you. glad you came. You've done um, great things. You did a fantastic job at TSR and at Wizards of the Coast working on 3rd edition. And you've done so many great products since then. You know, your, your body of work is something to be really proud of. Well, thank you. Absolutely. And, and uh, I'm proud that, uh, to have you on the show, and I'm glad you came by. I'm so happy that you would invite me. All yeah. right.
Great. All right. Well, good. All right. We got. We All should, right. I feel like we kisses. should make out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Feels over uh, here. So, um, uh, thank you, Monty, for being on the show. Emma, thank you for being my co-host. Thank you for uh, Will Marcus uh, for uh, being over there and keeping us all going. Uh, and um, thanks to uh, Gen Con TV for being our host and for Caldeo Studios for being our venue. And uh, thank you for watching our show. We really appreciate it. And we have some great um, shows coming up, uh, by the way. So uh, today's Wednesday, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Wednesday. Okay, sure. so tonight we have the Westgate Irregulars coming on at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, all these Pacific time. Uh, Friday we have at 11 a.m. we have table takes, and we have at 12.30 the new release rundown. And then Friday night we have Alien RPG actual play being run by Derek Guter with our Emma uh, Larkins and Bonsai and Javion and Joe. Yep. Uh, playing uh, the Alien RPG, uh, which I played with Derek too. In fact, I might come in and clean up, clean up some of the uh, the narrative wells uh, <laughs> towards the end of that series. Um, we have also on Friday a podcast of this episode will be released on the podcast place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have, <laughs> we have my, uh, uh, Monday 6 p.m. We have board games with the Brothers Murph. Mon uh, Wednesday at 9 a.m. Minis with the, the Murphs. I almost said Smurfs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Minis with the Murphs. And then back uh, back to our show, 4 p.m. next Wednesday. And our guest next Wednesday will be Todd Lockwood. Very so good. come check out one of the premier, one of the very influential artists of third edition. Worked on uh, designing a lot of the characters and um, uh, stuff for third edition. And, um, and a great guy. So we're looking forward to him. And the week after that, March 4th, we'll have Don Mirren, who was the art director for uh, for TSR, uh, Brandon Wizard of Coast. So that's it. Again, thank you for watching, and uh, hope to see you back here next week.